welcome to the session. My name is Pete Collins. I'm the Student Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Officer at University of Birmingham and um, helping to um, moderate the questions and answers is my colleague Sammy Lee, who is Student Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Advisor. And it's an uh, absolute pleasure to be welcoming um, Dr. Uh, Professor Fiona Kamari Campbell, who will be discussing uh, disability uh, consciousness raising and COVID-19 possibilities and challenges. So in this uh, session, um, Fiona is going to explain that whilst the COVID-19 epidemic has had horrific um, consequences in terms of life, social, uh, social isolation, and the demonization of public and aged people and challenges to the economy, it's also acted as a moment to reappraise the meaning of disability and affords the opportunity to build up the disability rights movement. Um, Fiona is Professor of Disability and Ableism Studies uh, at the School of Education and Social Work at the University of Dundee. She's an adjunct professor in disability studies, faculty of medicine at the University of Kalania, Sri Lanka, and a disabled BAME person. She writes about the Global South Theory, Disability Studies, Disability in South Asia, DIS Technology, and is a world leader in scholarship around studies of ableism. So it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you, Fiona. And uh, the session will be recorded, um, so it will be made available after. But as for now, Fiona, it's over to you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Pete, and thanks to the University of Birmingham for uh, inviting me to present today. Might just move on to the first slide here, Sammy. Oh, here we go. Great. So uh, I've got roughly 30 minutes uh, to cover a whole lot of areas, so I won't be able to do justice to this issue. My aim really is just to raise the issue of uh, consciousness raising and disabled people and just to promote an understanding of consciousness raising you may not have heard about uh, the concept and how it certainly uh, worked in the past so um, I'm going to smatter scatter the presentation with a few kind of cut and paste quotes throughout on to the next slide Sammy please so first slide, eight reasons for this topic and why, why I even got into this. Actually, it started off with five and then I started adding more and more. So there's probably more than eight reasons. Uh, so my own participation in consciousness raising groups in the late 1970s. No, I'm not that old. Uh, in 1979, as a 16 year old, I think I must have participated in one of the last consciousness raising groups uh, in Australia. Uh, um, so yeah, and that was a great experience. Uh, New dis second reason, new, new disabilities or health conditions, underlying health conditions um, have emerged as a result of COVID-19 or um, they may have already existed, but we didn't know much about them. And uh, particularly in terms of uh, the kind of the, the proliferation of Facebook's groups for shielded persons. And the third reason, uh, I did a project uh, in 2018 on um, social care in prisons, a new vision of social care in prisons, and this is in Scotland. Um, and one of the things that we found was disabled, with disabled prisoners, um, many of them had acquired their disability while serving their sentence. And yet uh, there was little intervention in terms of ass assisting them and supporting them in terms of um, disability adjustment and formation of their disability identity. So that sort of got me thinking at that stage. Four, my own work on internalised ableism, which I'll talk about a little bit, um, and the effects of internalised ableism on um, disability consciousness raising. Then five, we could do a whole session on this, the complex issue of disclosure of disability in the workplace. And I know that's been a real issue with the uh, National Association of Disabled Staff Networks in universities. Six, the rise of new eugenics. I've put it in inverted commas because some people are saying if you use the word eugenics, it's a bit over the top, but there's definitely a discussion about this new form of eugenics, disposable lives, and therefore the need for us to mobilize and to counter these discourses and seven the invisibility of disabled people in universities. We have such, again, it's linked to the disclosure issue, such low disclosure rates and institutionalized ableism in universities. And finally eight, you might, this is an etymology, etymology uh, moment. The meaning of the word crisis comes from the Greek word chrysos, 
And crisis um, actually is a moment of opportunity. So this is our moment through the uh, terrible impact of COVID-19 on disabled people and aged persons, uh, whilst not diminishing uh, the tragedy and uh, the sorrow and the deaths, uh, it does provide us with an opportunity to kind of recap, stop and rethink. Next slide, please, Sammy. Now, this is always a good idea when you, you write the structure of your presentation and then you deviate from it. So I'm going to talk about the situation of disabled people. What are the challenges around identity formation? I'm going to talk about what consciousness raising groups are and uh, what has there been their impact, because I don't make any assumptions that you, the audience, actually know what consciousness raising groups are. Then I'm going to, three and four have actually been combined. So I'm going to do a little bit of a critique of consciousness raising and how it might apply to disability. And then also talk about the challenges to building um, consciousness raising as a strategy for dis disability upliftment. But I have actually combined three and four together. Okay, next slide, please, Sammy. Okay, this is where we're going to slow down a little bit. So, <laughs> The situation of disabled people in our society and how disabled people shape and form and develop their identities is quite unique compared to, for example, identity formation on the basis of sexuality, um, ethnicity, uh, sex, religion, etc. So there are some quite unique uh, and, and novel situations. So the first thing is uh, I want to talk about is the fact is it's very hard to develop a, a affirmative disability identity. And I'm not saying, when I say affirmative disability identity, I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about that it's all, you know, happy-go-lucky and we can go rah, 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 disability pride. Affirmative disability identity really does um, hold in tension the idea of joy and despair. It's often disability is an experience of ambivalence, uh, of challenge, but that doesn't mean it can't be affirmative. And it's difficult in a society that's dominated by ableist thinking and ableist practices. The other challenge to building up mobilization and consciousness raising is the fact that uh, disabled people are a motley crew. We're very heterogeneous. Uh, and so, so even building a gathering of a heterogeneous group, heterogeneous in terms of our impairment types, but also in terms of our lived experiences, uh, there's intergenerational differences in terms of people's uh, experience of being shaped and formed by the cultural and economic realities of disability. And also there's the issue of internalised ableism, you know, processing and working towards this affirmative disability identity um, is as a lifelong process. So people are at different stages of, um, in the journey. Um, and this impacts on the promotion of a positive uh, disability identity. And I'll, I'll touch upon some of that later. Um, however, I do think that uh, engagement with various forms of disability consciousness raising, it can provide people with an exposure to understanding disability beyond individualization beyond privatisation and beyond mere mentoring. So consciousness raising is something quite different from mentoring. Mentoring, uh, I'm a great believer in mentoring projects for disabled people, but it's different. And I think, again, I just want to emphasise beyond individualism because actually we live in a society where we don't look at commonalities, we don't necessarily look at structural realities. And even the Equalities Act, if you think about it, protected characteristics, it's done on a case by case basis. It's very privatised. OK, so this can. And so there are some challenges there. I believe that consciousness raising can help us connect the dots between disability theories and the way in which we experience disability in our life. And the final situation is that we actually have very limited exposure to affirmative representations of disability. So disabled people themselves have limited uh, exposures. Onto, onto the next slide, please, Sammy. So again, continuing this theme of hiddenness and invisibility, we are definitely one of the most uh, hidden groups in the community and within universities, given this is a you know, university setting. So, Talking about disability is actually important. And one of the things I've noticed, uh, this is the first year at the University of Dundee that we've had Disability History Month. And I understand from Pete, it's the first time that the University of Birmingham has had 
the Disability History Month. And one of the things I've noticed, and it's a little bit too soon to totally get a sense of it, but it's putting, it's putting disability on the radar uh, with uh, the student community, the academic community, and uh, significantly senior management. So uh, I think actually the more we talk about disability, the better. Uh, however, how we talk about disability is important because uh, the categories we use actually uh, organise our understandings. In other words, talking about disability uh, gives shape to knowledge, right? So, and I'll come back to this, this, this later. I mean, Bell Hooks, for example, a very famous um, uh, racism scholar, talked about that theory was a place of healing. Theory helped her make sense of her lived experience. So we're constantly seeing this relationship between theorising and the lived experience and the lived experience contributing to theory. Okay, and just by the way, I've put references here and I have a reference list at the end of the slides and the slides will be made available to you uh, later. But here is the challenge. And I'm sure many of you will be aware of this. Maybe you're one of these people. This is not an exercise in shaming, by the way, but the fact is many people with disabilities don't identify themselves as disabled. So that's the first thing. Do not identify themselves as disabled or they choose, if they do, choose not to be part of a politically active community of disabled persons, okay? Now, this was written by Richard Scott, a, a disabled academic um, in the US in 1988. And you might be thinking, why am I using something out of 1988? Because he's one of the few people that's actually written about this. So we've got a problem actually, this is an area where there's just really, really limited research, right? But his article's great and I really would recommend you to read it. Exclusion, however, exclusion and discriminatory treatment alone, right? So shit happens, right? I don't know if I'm allowed to use that word at the University of Birmingham, but we use it in Australia, right? So even though all this crap happens, there you go, nicer word, uh, that alone does not necessarily inherently generate a collective identity or political action, right? So terrible, terrible things and terrible things have happened in COVID and before COVID. Right, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we suddenly have let's ha all hands on deck and get politically active, right? And Scotch again has said, and to use his language, the unattractive role of disabled of disabled persons, um, it's, I think there's a typo there, can serve to discourage both self identification as a member of an excluded group, and the likelihood of political action flowing from that identification. And we're talking about this before we started today. I mean, you know, disability is not a sexy, cat, a sexy category. There's not brownie points. There's no benefits that by dis disclosing disability. So this becomes a, a real problem. And also because of the stigma as well. Moving along a bit. You know, next slide, please. And I have to uh, also make sure that I am um, don't over talk too. So disability dispersal and partition, partitioned individualism. Now you might think I'm being very melodramatic here, but I'm not. Right. So one of the problems that we've had is unlike other groups, mainstreaming has actually resulted in disabled people being separated from each other. Now, just to put it on record, I am not anti-mainstreaming, right? But one of the issues around mainstreaming is it's like a scattergun effect. Disabled people uh, are put into mainstream schools. They've had very little contact with other disabled students, for example, right? Same in the workplace, right? And um, so that presents particular challenges. Uh, for example, there isn't an automatic sense of culture or solidarity, for example, in groups based on racism and sexism, the kind of, you know, um, identity politics in interest groups um, where maybe there are already existing communities um, and cultures that are there. So that is a real problem. Disabled people often haven't necessarily met a person um, with a disability before or a person with which with with whom that they can um, actually identify sorry just looking at the timing here okay so that is a real challenge so not only are you in your own little individual box you're not being exposed to other ways of, of experiencing disability and uh, I think in my case it happened by accident uh, I first started off my my first job was in a sheltered workshop uh, getting paid 50 cents a day putting lids on bottles but then I, I left that after two weeks. Um, and then I volunteered at a uh, place called the Disability Resource Centre. 
uh, which was run by and for disabled people. So then I got to see different ages, different disabilities and people doing really interesting things. And the fact that people didn't have two heads, you know, so that because uh, I acquired my disability at 18, I had all the baggage that most people have, right? But you don't often necessarily get exposure to that. And that was in the early 1980s where there were thousands of these kind of activist groups. So, I, and you know, timing is everything. Check it out. Alex Harvey, 1st of December 2020, hot off the press from The Guardian. Uh, I put the reference to the article, but what a beautiful quote for me, hey? I struggle to use the term disability and quite honestly, I still don't know if I should. No one has given me the green light. I seldom tick the box on the form and I never take up the designated seats on the bus. The pain of standing is often less hassle than feeling judged for sitting. On the face of it, there's nothing wrong with me. That's what makes things tricky. I worry about people taking a dim view. So, you know, this is like I said, lucky for me. Um, and so here is here is a, a man, I think it was a man, but basically saying, you know, acquiring a disability and trying to work out where he fits. He's almost in that twilight zone. And actually we often find because there is this sharp distinction between disabled and abled bodied, uh, what happens to all the folk in between, you know? And, uh, and this is something that COVID's also brought out, this lovely elusive phrase, underlying health condition. You could almost do a rap song to it. Next slide, please. Okay. Let's, I need to keep moving here, Sue. So COVID, disability is an afterthought. So I've just put the definition of shielding up there. You probably should know that. Um, I think the important thing about, this is this moment of opportunity. What's happening? What's actually happening? Well, we're finding that groups who, who do not traditionally um, identify as disabled or haven't been even regarded as disabled are being brought into the fold. And actually often people with underlying health conditions are actually forced to disclose that to their managers as part of the COVID management uh, policy. Uh, we've also seen a growth in mutual aid groups, particularly on Facebook and, and the like, um, and other disability groups have always been there. And suddenly this new bunch is coming in, right? But mm, interesting tension points, some quite uncomfortable conversations about suitable language, the idea of burden, um, hierarchies of disability, and you know that lovely phrase, oh, there's always somebody worse off than me. I love that phrase. It's like, well, but but it's you with that experience. And then we've got that kind of oppression Olympic stuff going on. So these are very interesting groups where everybody's had to try and problem solve around these different cultures, different groups coming together. So the, the challenge then is how do we harness these new entrants into, dis, into the disability community, right? Uh, what we know with COVID is that, that there's been exposure to the apartheid realities experienced by disabled people. This idea that our lives are disposable and that there's gaps in social care. Next slide, please. Right, so I'm just gonna quickly go through this, not gonna spend it, this is literally a cut and paste job, right? So one of the things I found out in my research is to try and look at, well, you know, are there consciousness raising groups in the UK, let alone disabled ones, right? Um, anyway, there's an organization called the World Transformed, W, sorry, TWT, right? That's the initials they use. Well, they actually ran consciousness raising groups in the early stages of lockdown. I've put the reference in the reference list. Check it out. There's a great report. So they, 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 they ran these groups uh, for 12 people and they ran it uh, monthly, right? Um, and they, they looked, they, as part of their groups, they, the thing with consciousness raising groups is when you meet, you pick a, a, a series of questions or themes for each meeting. So they looked at these about how is being confined to our homes affecting our thought patterns? Uh, you know, how do, how do we feel about this? I'm just paraphrasing these questions here. Will the experience of the pandemic give us a new perspective on political and economic dynamics that uh, structure our lives? And how do we mitigate any claustrophobic feelings or loneliness as we were stuck in our houses away from people we care about, right? Now these weren't, again, it wasn't a disability group. It was just for, for people um, who are under lockdown and what their experiences were. Now, just to emphasize, this was, this was I, I have not found any other example of this in the UK. Now I'm not saying that 
people didn't have conversations with disabled people. I know SWAN, the Scottish Women's Autism Network, which I'm involved with, for example, sent out a survey to 800 members and about the COVID experiences. So we're getting that, but this is a very different process. This is about people bearing their hearts, bearing their souls, finding common points, and obviously strategizing. Next slide, please. Okay. So I just, uh, what I want to say about this slide, because I'm just watching the clock here, it always is the way. I've already talked about the issue that, you know, it, strange ableist environments, and then what, how does that impact on these strange times that we're living in? I'm sure the folk who ran those consciousness raising groups in late March wouldn't have dreamt of the fact of December now, and we're still dealing with this reality, you know? So, um, again, this idea of disabled people being actively dispersed and separated from each other, right? And in some instances, it's been really active. For example, social role valorization theory, the work of Wolf Wolfensberger, uh, actually talked about that disabled people shouldn't associate with each other, or according to his words, other deviants as well, at least that kind of increase one's devaluation. So there's some real challenges there. Internalized ableism, that people, uh, because of disability, self-hatred and devaluing, don't want to associate with other disabled people, right? And to, uh, and that's made meeting and finding commonality with other disabled people challenging, right? I've talked about the deprivation of role models. You know, as, as a professor of disability and ableism studies, uh, I'm one of the few senior disabled uh, people at my university. And, uh, you know, it's quite a responsibility because we just don't see the use, uh, mentoring and uh, role models for disabled people. And uh, the explicit use of consciousness raising groups has been limited. And in fact, uh, you know, there's almost been no literature on disability and consciousness raising. Actually, I found one and that's after the second lot of search. So we're actually, this is new territory. And again, I've talked about the rise of new eugenics and um, uh, disposable lives. Okay, just if we can move on. To the next slide. Now I, I've got two definitions of ableism in this slide. I'm only going to put one up just for time, okay? Just because ableism, lots of people use the word, but people often don't talk about what they mean by it. So that's really important, okay? So ableism is a network of beliefs. So there's an ethics kind of ideology, if you want to use. There are processes and practices that actually produce a particular kind of self and body that becomes a corporeal, a bodily standard. So and I the idea of, of, of perfection. What is species typical? What does it mean to be a human being, okay? And therefore there's this framework of what, what it means to be essential and fully human. And then disability and other categories now are often cast off as a dis diminished state of being human. Now I wrote this in 2001, so it's quite old. Actually it was a footnote, which is even more frightening. Um, I would also, my work also, for example, covers issues like the caste system in India, for example. So I would probably add to that and put disability and caste and a few other categories in there. If we can just uh, skip the next slide and move on to what is consciousness raising. So I've got 10 minutes, crikey. I think it's 10 minutes. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to go through this fast. And as I said, you can have these slides and you digest this. This is the cut and paste. So I've gone through, there's three slides on this, right? So firstly, consciousness raising came from uh, radical femin feminism in the 1960s and 70s, right? And actually, it's pretty amazing. In 1973, in the United States, 100,000 women were participating in consciousness raising groups. So that tells you how amazing and what a movement this was, at least in 1973. It's a global movement. It was a Praxis political strategy adopted by women's liberation, right? So Praxis, which is about practice, right? Lived experience and political strategy. Consciousness raising moves reflection from just looking at personal troubles to situated, situating social exclusion within a broader structural reality of power relations. So, so consciousness raising groups are not bitch sessions, they're not therapy groups, and they're not necessarily self-help groups, right? So it's about kind of looking at your experience, looking to commonality, and then developing political strategies. Now, K Kathy Sarah Child in 1978, you'll find lots of old references in here. She is credited with developing CR groups 
She said they were intended for small groups of women. In fact, the nominal number seems to be about up to 10 um, women sharing their experiences through personal testimony, relating to one another, and then generalizing from those experiences. So you're getting a pattern happening here. These CR groups discussed forms of resistance and began theorizing to make sense of their collective experiences. So by having people share their experiences, looking at the collective experiences, the important next step is to develop and take action, right? To strategize, to inform theory, but also to inform activism, right? So it's different from empowerment groups or conscientization, which I can barely say, initiatives. Next slide, please. Okay, just moving through a bit of a cut and paste here again. Larson says, so again, just I'm just giving you different, a different flavour for each of these because it's explained in different ways. So consciousness raising groups aim to explore the origin of our dissatisfaction and unhappiness, right? That was previously experienced re resulting from a personal flaw. I'm sure many of you get that. What's wrong with me? How come I'm not up to standard? Why aren't I coping, right? Um, instead of saying it's got a relationship to social oppression. It's amazing how we start blaming ourselves for things. Again, Campbell, not me, by the way, 1973. I was only 10. Okay, consciousness raising process is designed to address affirmation of the effective, of the validity of personal experience, that's important, of the necessity for self-exposure and self-criticism. Now, I want to put, the reason why I picked this quote is, Actually, there's a dynamic going on here. It's not just about you saying, hey, this happened to me, and then the next person saying, this happened to me. The question and answers, there's kind of self-exposure, but also self-reflection by people asking you questions, right? And actually, this is very interesting. I did look at it later, but too late for these PowerPoints. This was actually based on a very uh, ancient Chinese model of what's called self-criticism. So this idea that in a safe space, you can kind of dialogue, right? Uh, Sarah Child again, everything we have to know, have to prove, uh, we can get from the realities of our own lives. So, and we'll talk about later why that might raise a problem, but this idea that knowledge, meaningful knowledge is grounded in the lived experience. Um, consciousness raising actions brought to the public uh, for the specific purpose of challenging old ideas and raising new ones. And I think, uh, you know, they also looked at it as being a research method to test the readings, uh, test the scientific method of research. And in fact, they argued that consciousness raising was a genuine form of research. Okay, I'm going to move through to, because I've got, I think it's right. I think I've probably got about five minutes. Would that be right, Pete? You're doing fine, Fiona. Yeah, you can uh, take as long as you need. Okay, uh, we can just move to the next slide and the one after. Okay, you can, as I said, you'll get these slides, you can go back and study these little nuggets, because they really are nuggets of wisdom from the old days, but heck, this is 2014 now, so we're now getting modern. <laughs> uh, Rosa Ross, wrote, 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 sorry, wrote, Loretta Ross, get it right. We may have, we may have more formally called it consciousness raising, but in essence, we were telling each other stories to reclaim our lives as a validation, our humanity. We created a feminist future with these stories, not through narratives of logic and structure, but by creating verbal snapshots of the lived experiences of women. We didn't have to all tell the same story in order to resonate with each other. Each story was unique, but the act of telling our stories created strong bonds among diverse women who looked together to change our realities. Okay, let's move to the next lot of slides. Actually, I've only got two left, which is uh, next slide. Yes. Okay, so that works in quite well. I think I'll make it, Pete, in five minutes. Let's see. Okay, might have to borrow one more minute or so. Okay, two slides left, but they're packed. Okay, so what are the challenges in doing this? As I said to you, this was developed uh, by uh, feminism in the 1970s. It was picked up by other um, people of colour groups, for example. It kind of died an ugly death, probably hmm, in the 80s. You, it, sort, it sort of died and other, other kinds of things were, were happening. But uh, as you can see, it's starting to resurrect. But what are the challenges for us disability networks and communities. So one of the challenges I've already pointed to is um, personal and political organising around disability is ableism. You know, I have this joke and Pete, you'll love this. We did organise two years ago, a, um, 
a disclosure workshop at our university, right? And uh, but the problem is we couldn't get any speakers because they wouldn't disclose their disability. So, so, so this is a problem. It's like some secret society. I mean, they were they these people were we had disclosed their disability in the staff network, the disabled staff network, but when it meant putting their name on a page around disclosure of disability and talking about their experiences, no, they everyone bailed out. So we had to cancel it. Okay, so it's a bit of a joke, but there's a element. Of, so that I'm raising it because that gives you the sense of how serious this is. Even getting people to disclose that they have a disability, or even if they don't, um, to join a disabled staff network because you don't have to have disclosed, it's really tough. Um, you know, in my own school, there are a number of disabled people I know of, uh, but they, they, they've not disclosed their disability and it's really, it's, it's difficult, right? Uh, we're all socialised from the day that we're born into embracing an ableist eth ethos, so we carry this baggage around, all of us. So this is not just about able-bodied people, it's ourselves as well. And we, we live our lives according to this ableist ethic, you know. Every time we look in the mirror and think, oh, that's not a great look. Every time we look at ourselves on Zoom videos. So our ideas of health and wholeness and that idea of being a contributory person. So this is really important. Even the idea when you're negotiating with your employer to say, hey, I can do this job. I'm productive. I can contribute. But actually in the back of your mind, the monkey on your back, you're thinking, actually, maybe I'm dragging the heels a bit. Maybe I'm a bit of a burden. I do believe consciousness raising is an elixir to challenging internalized ableism because it's breaking the silence. We're breaking the patterns, right? And that's the first start. And to know that this is not about personal failure, you're not alone. And hopefully through strength and solidarity and sharing common experiences, we can get ahead of ourselves here. Uh, so promoting engagement in disabled staff networks, as I said, you, is, it, it is a challenge, and I've just mentioned that. Um, and a lot of it is to do with internalised ableism, but a lot of it's to do with this kind of border policing about, well, what's a disability and what isn't, you know. And again, that hierarchy of disability stuff that comes up. Now, my final slide. Now, officially, I've got two minutes left, but I'm going to take a little bit more time. This is a packed slide. So this is a kind of like the challenges and the barriers all rolled into one. So I think the one of the big challenges is disclosure. If I put up an advert on Twitter or on Facebook and said, hey, let's join a disability consciousness raising group. I'm not sure how many people I'll get, except for my mates, because I'll twist their arm, right? So this is a, a challenge in itself to try and, and particularly for the people, the hard to reach people that we need to have in. Right, so it's varied. So this is a lovely quote um, from Kirschbaum. Invisible disability, passing, masquerade, coming out, covering. As the range of these terms suggest, disability's disclosure is not a single event, not a once and for all action, but rather an ongoing process of, con of continuity continuously in a variety of settings and contexts, performing and negotiating disability awareness and percep perceptibility. And I know for myself, it's, I, you know, I've, I've had a disability since 1981 and I have a couple of other disabilities as well. Um, you know, it's an ongoing process. It varies with your emotional states, your contextual states, and there are risks. I'm a wheelchair user for some of you who know me, but I'm also an autistic woman. And in fact, it's only recently that I've come out publicly as autistic. Uh, greater risks. In fact, often people with positions, uh, senior positions in universities are often um, discouraged from coming out as autistic. So this is a real issue, disclosure. The other issue that comes up, and I've got in, I'm into time now, two minutes. No experience is pre-theoretical. So this is one of the, the dangers of consciousness raising. It talks about privileging lived experience, privileging feelings, which is really important. But we can't just take those feelings and experiences on face value. Now, I'm a social theorist, so this is actually really important because actually how we name our experiences, how we talk about them are actually based on theoretical frameworks that we use. 
whether it be a conscious theoretical framework or stuff that we see on social media about how people talk about their experiences. So this is one of the kind of things that we have to kind of unpack. And I, but I think that's where the self-criticism comes in. We can't just say, oh, well, that's my experience and, and leave it at that, right? So we need to kind of have some quite dark, challenging discussions around that. I've already talked about the heterogeneity of disability and intersectional issues, right? So we have disabled people who are LGBT, who are BAME, uh, who are from religious minorities, uh, who are women, for example. How do all these other factors kind of kick in? So Keating has said here, several accounts of consciousness raising practice to discuss and celebrate difference. However, they often do so in a way that tends to obscure power relations among women rather than clarify or challenge them. And again, Keating's reference, the whole article is actually on that about, you know, um, are they safe spaces? How, who decides what are the issues that are discussed, particularly given that the personal sharing moves into strategizing right, strategizing around uh, power. Uh, the good news is, and I, um, I, I've, I've put up a reference to this, there's a group in the UK called Plan C, that's the name of the group, no more, no less. Um, they actually, in their own documentation of running consciousness raising groups, um, talk about minority members um, being able to prioritise what's important for them. So I don't know enough about it at this stage, how successful that's been, but it's good to know. Uh, again, from Keating, members identify and celebrate difference, but such affirmation does not necessarily challenge her to rethink her own position in relation to power and privilege, right? So again, it comes back to the dialogue and dynamics, just because somebody might speak to their own experience. You know, you potentially can put that in a box and say, well, that's got nothing to do with me. How does it actually challenge my own uh, perspective in relation to power? Okay, the final one, and we're doing okay here, I think, Pete, that's not bad. Uh, so, which I think is really important. I've just told you I found one research paper on consciousness raising and disability, right? Um, but there's actually limited contemporary examples of uh, consciousness raising in the UK. I didn't look beyond the UK. I would su suspect actually globally this is an issue. Uh, I did come up with a couple of examples. I haven't evaluated them in any respect and I will be writing a paper on this, but it's good to know. Portsmouth Abuse and Rape Crisis Counselling, PAST, uh, I'll put the web address there. That's a rape crisis service. Um, they've been running consciousness raising groups for, for young women, I think between about 15 and 18. And that's really great to see around body image issues, um, uh, harassment, sexual abuse right it's not a disability group but it's there so I think it's nice to know and from what I can gather it's been it's been really working quite well again up to 10 people so these are very concentrated um, groups plan C uh, apparently the C is meant to be consciousness raising they have uh, UK wide groups there's actually two in Scotland for the Scottish folk here and the rest are in England uh, so they've been running consciousness raising groups across the country. So I would definitely get you to Google that if you're interested in that. And then there's the World Transformed. Um, yes, the World Transformed, that's the name of the organization, TWT. And that's the, the pilot that, that, that I mentioned. So I don't know it, from their literature how long they continued the consciousness raising groups but again it's it's a start so what I've done if you could just do the next slide there and because it's going to be hard to see anyway is I've, I've bunched a whole stack of references there for you um, I have a list twice as long but I just really wanted to get this on the agenda today and I am I'm a member of the steering group of the National Association of Disabled Staff Networks as is Pete and uh, one of the things once I get this paper written is to maybe try and look at what possibility there is for NADSEN itself to facilitate, because we are a, a UK wide network, to facilitate some kind of pilot program for consciousness raising groups for disabled staff, at least at universities at this stage. So thank you very much. I know that was rushed. Um, happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Fiona. That was absolutely brilliant. And, you know, speaking from um, my own perspective, and my experience of autism, incredibly um, moving. Uh, when we talk about um, how we, we self-censor and we don't feel that it's safe to be completely open about the things that we, we struggle with. Um, so uh, we, we have got some um, questions that um, Sammy's going to be um, looking at and reading out um, shortly, but um, just very quickly, I wondered if you could um, 
explain, give, given the, the world that we live in, the culture, the environment, the economic system, what way, there, there seems to be so much fear that we have as, as disabled people about being um, open and honest and uh, confronting power. I mean, what, what would you say are, are, are useful strategies to try and combat that internalized fear and internalized atheism? Well, I, look, I think there's two things. One is um, not so much disability. I read the report of the organisation that did the consciousness raising, you know, during the COVID lockdown. And there were a couple of issues there. They used Zoom, but they set it up in a way uh, where, um, as, as one com one testimonial person, one person said, oh, I've never seen Zoom used like this before because we've got a very primitive idea. But you, there's, there's a way you can set it up to make it quite... Uh, quite rich and certainly um, the report that again I've put it up in the reference list provides an amazing range of testimonials. I think the hardest thing is getting somebody to commit to a group. It seems from what I can gather and certainly from my own experience although it was a long long time ago is that once people get a foot through the door and attend their first meeting they actually get quite hooked because people from from the from the the, you know, from the start, it, be, it becomes a transformative process. Uh, and again, I think the, 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 the challenge here is, is a non-judgmental environment. Uh, I think we, it, you know, the groups tend to, I mean, there's a debate within the CR community about whether you have specialised facilitators or whether you just kind of, you know, have somebody come in but I think it's being aware of those sensitivities I'm 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 an optimist Pete because I've, I've seen some of these issues negotiated in the mutual aid groups online where it's a bit like two two cultures meet you know people who've had nothing to do with disability and they do they put their foot in it and you know they talk about disabled people being disordered or um burdens <laughs> and instead of the normal kind of abuse that you might get if somebody uses that sort of language actually it's been a gentle process of um explaining so it's it's work that's not to say they've uh, they've not been tensions I think, look, you know, I was thinking about this the other day in terms of the first part of your question is the importance of visibil visibility. You know, there is a section and I decided not to put it in the PowerPoints because I didn't have enough room that talks about um, actually under the Equalities Act, one of the things that they comment on, actually, it's very difficult for the university to provide any reasonable adjustments if you haven't disclosed. So there's a real catch 22 with this. And I think not that I would like, I don't like the idea of people being compelled but one of the things with COVID is people had to I don't know what it was like with your university but we had an email saying that if you have an underlying health condition you need to report this to your line manager it's actually kind of legal responsibility so in that sense the choice was taken away but I do think one of the things with like with Disability History Month is more visibility um, I've had no negative responses to coming out publicly as autistic um, in fact, the opposite has happened. Uh, wanted um, and has enabled people to say, not only can you be an academic, you can be a professor. Um, you know, and and that's not to say it is hard. And that's the other thing we need to support people who are disabled leaders because actually burnout and frustration it can be very difficult because often we have to do the heavy lifting. But that's where consciousness raising groups solve things too because you don't have to bear this on your own. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Sammy, um, how, how, how are we looking in terms of questions? Yep, we have quite many questions. Well, let's try to answer as many as though. Um, so, first of all, there's a question about, uh, Fiona, what do you consider your greatest success in breaking down barriers at your institution? And what would you say is the greatest barrier as well? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my position, so I'm a professor of disability and ableism studies. It's the first position of its type in the world. So I think that's pretty successful and it's beyond myself. I'm not sure if the university itself is realizing what it's what it's what it's done. I, I think, to be honest, uh, my greatest success in breaking down barriers has been my very presence. I mean, obviously we're in lockdown now, but when we were doing face-to-face -face teaching, I mean, I, I never asked the students, but I, I, I imagine it would have been quite unfamiliar having somebody rock up in a wheelchair taking classes. 
I'd never been taught by anybody in a wheelchair before. But also, I used to always talk about, like I was teaching professionals, so I teach social workers, right? But I always talk about my experience as a, ser a service user. I talk about the fact that I'm actually quite suspicious of social workers <laughs> and where that suspicion has come from. And here am I teaching in a social work school. So I think it's about, again, it's that disability talk that I highlighted at the start of the PowerPoints. I think the more that we, we talk about this, but we also need support systems because it can be very exhausting having to do the emotional labour. So thank you. So the next question is, do you think it should be in all university programs learning about disability and then have open discussion about it? Um, I, think, I think disability, uh, actually, in terms of the law, uh, and um, having uh, an accessible and integrated and mainstream curriculum, actually all the protected characteristics need to be integrated throughout everything that is taught, right? And I think particularly disability, but I must put a plug here because there's very bad ways of teaching disability. So we need to have disability studies or studies in ableism. We don't need more pathological teaching, you know, about the ab abnormalcy of autism, for example. Uh, so I think that's really important. So it needs to saturate um, all schools and, no and all schools, um, uh, you know, disability, it can be covered in it. So just because you're doing mathematics, you might think, well, that's not relevant. Well, it is relevant. I think also we should be, uh, and this is really important. I think universities in particular need to be taking positive actions. There are positive action provisions under the Equalities Act. Universities have been very shy about this. Uh, there was a case two or three weeks ago the first case of its sort in 10 years since the Equalities Act. It wasn't about disability, it was about religion, um, but the, that judgment was very important. So I would like universities to, you know, to cut the crap, uh, cut, the, cut the platitudes, step up. We are underrepresented as staff and as students. So how do you level the playing field? You level it by taking positive actions. Right. You can't just use the standard kind of, you know, disabled people are welcome to apply and just leave it at that. Yeah, thank you. Um, how do you see um, CL differ from empowerment? Well, now there's a, I've got an article about that. I th empowerment is quite, mm, there are different models and approaches to empowerment for a start, right? So why is sometimes professionals speak about empowerment? It's something that's done to you always reminds me like washing a dog. You are empowered. We're going to do it to you, right? Uh, the other thing is empowerment uh, actually uh, in many ways can dis empowerment theories can discriminate against people with learning disabilities because firstly it assumes that people are in control of their lives. They have a degree of agency and that everybody wants to be super independent. Uh, so there's some real problems about empowerment to do what? Based on what? Uh, the idea of empowerment, what idea of the human subject are we talking about, you know, at, at atomistic individuals or um, interrelated social uh, individuals. So that's a really uh, important issue. The other problem is empowerment is, um, is very individualized. It's about just empowering the person. It doesn't make that link to the structural analysis and the common themes. So there's a question about whether you can talk a bit about intersectionalities um, between race, racisms and ableisms and how that impacts both the running of consciousness raising groups for disabled people and people's reluctance to disclose disability status. Okay, that could be a whole lecture. <laughs> I, I, and in all seriousness, I would recommend, I have a YouTube channel and I talk about uh, race, racism and ableism and the intersections, right? And I also have a um, academia edu page as well, which has got a whole bunch of articles. Um, intersectionality is really important. Um, one of the things in my work on ableism, ableism is not just about disability, right? And that's where people sometimes they don't go any further. Ableism is, is studies in ableism is the study of what we mean by abledness, right? Or, uh, or ability or able-bodiedness, right? So it's about a particular kind of system that values particular kinds of bodies, right? So um, I'm about, for example, to have an article pass, uh, published on looking at 
caste, the Indian caste system. I mentioned that before. Um, I think we need to do a lot more work on cultural understandings, particularly non-Western understandings of the body, what kinds of bodies are valued, what kinds of emotions, what kinds of minds, because uh, then we will find then, for example, how different cultural traditions are privileged, for example, uh, uh, masculinity, patriarchal societies, uh, or particular forms of, of, of perfection, and also how they understand uh, people who uh, deviate from that. So, for example, I come from a South Asian background and a Buddhist background, so often, for example, the role of karma and these kinds of things. So you can see it's really, really complex. I believe that ableism is a universal phenomenon, but it's particularized. Ableism takes on a different shape and form depending upon which communities we live in and what uh, historical time, what historical moment that we're in. So I think um, one of the things I want to say, just because some people get a bit, bit uh, uh, what's the word, alarmed when I say this, I do believe that there is uh, ableism actually, scientific racism is part of ableism, right? Homophobia is part of ableism, right? Patriarchy is part of ableism. But I'm not trying to ride over the top of those. I'm, when I say that these different systems of subordination are part of ableism, I'm not saying that they're equivalent. So for example, if people experience racism, that is a very particular form of, um, of, of ableism. So racism is a particular form of ableism. Um, people's experiences of ableism may differ from disability, which is another form of ableism, right? And that's where consciousness raising groups are, are quite rich in terms of the exchange. It would be nice in an ideal world to have consciousness raising groups made up of a mixture of minority people. And in fact, there's another article I've got on coalition politics and using consciousness raising uh, groups for coalition building. Uh, but I think we need to we take the first baby step, which is having groups for disabled people because we haven't got that. So in the context of higher education, if staff are not able or comfortable to be open about their identity as disabled, how can non-disabled staff support students with disabilities to engage in CR in a way that isn't patronizing or problematic? Uh, you know, that's a really, really good question. Um, and I have to be a bit careful here, but this is a really complex area. I know people who teach disability studies, right? You would expect a certain level of enlightenment for people who teach disability studies, who those people are not prepared to come out as disabled. They've told me. So that's the degree of internalized ableism. You would think that on the basis of that discipline alone, people would come out, but there is such a fear. Um, it is an, it sometimes, and again, we need to look at why people don't disclose. I think we need to have more research in this. Some of it, fear seems to be the theme I keep hearing, um, and that's a perceived fear, or it might be a real case of fear, and uh, it doesn't really matter. It's fear is fear. Um, but there also may be this idea that, well, maybe my disability is not as significant because we all internalise this hierarchy of disability as well. I think uh, in terms of working with students around this issue, I think it's how it's, it's the tone that you use. Um, you know, that's the tone that you use to encourage um, consciousness raising. I think like we've got disabled staff networks, we also need disabled students groups. And in fact, possibly there might be a greater openness to this. I have no proof uh, among disabled students because maybe because they're younger for a start. And um, yeah, so I don't know what the, the, we've got lots of big divides. I think if people see different experiences and are exposed, maybe it will be less it's frightening. I have no answers really for that. So in terms of university support, um, do you think university will ever become willing to support people with energy limiting conditions like CFS? I think universities need to look at institutional ableism and we need to talk about that. We're only just starting to get traction around institutionalized racism. And even then there are folk out there who don't believe institutionalized racism exists. So again, it's a kind of like, you know, if we can wave a magic wand, it'd be great, but it's very much incremental. And that's why I'm saying the power of studies in ableism is it goes beyond disability. We need to work out what are 
the models, the conceptualizations of the ideal employee in a university, right? And, you know, professional services staff, academic staff. So this idea of being contributory and productive, we know with COVID, a lot of the things that disabled staff have been wanting for years in terms of reasonable accommodations, working at home, different equipment, different hours, we were told that this was not possible. This was exceptionalised, you know, look at you people carrying on, asking for special rights. And then we find, you know, you have a pandemic and it becomes, everybody gets it, right? And part of the thing is to make sure that we don't go back to the old normal, right? I think it's about university seriously. I think we need to, as a community, talk about institutionalised ableism, how we structure our time, how we me me uh, measure contribution. Um, even at the moment, for example, the idea of what I call the unencumbered worker. So that's somebody who's available 24 seven, you know, body for hire, right? Uh, it doesn't take into account, for example, uh, sex, sex relations of care, that women, for example, are primarily carers of children and, um, and old, older people. It doesn't take the fact of who's gonna cook the, the meals and the washing uh, and the fact that people, you know, with disabilities have um, energy living, limiting conditions. Uh, this is a really big issue because actually they're the people that get picked off. So I know the person who probably asked that would be aware of that. They're the ones that are told, well, you know, if you haven't got the stamina or if you've got the fatigue, maybe you should go part time or maybe better you should get the hell out of here. Uh, so we need to really educate. One of the things I'm trying to uh, encourage my university to do is have a in, interdisciplinary case conference model for reasonable adjustments, right? Because if we leave it to the medical people, I, I fear that we are in the, the land of danger because they see these things as deficits. So thank you. There are more questions coming. Um, let me try to cover as many as possible. So what do you think the role of disabled persons organizations in pandemic? What should be um, their focus? And what should they um, be linking up with? Well, it's a bit, a little, that question, I mean, it's an important question, but a bit, a little bit outside the, the context of this, this lecture. I mean, I'm involved in a number of disabled persons organisations. I think the really big issue at the moment is 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 poverty uh, and, and, and the ugly edge of poverty that COVID has exposed. Uh, the fact that uh, there is a prioritisation system in terms of, um, you know, different rules for people with, with disabled people and aged people with COVID, it's, it's exposed that. Um, it will be really interesting to see how the vaccine queue line plays out. Um, I think the, the connection between social care and poverty, it needs to be prioritised as an action campaign uh, to make sure that governments do this. The other thing is the relationship between uh, disability and employment, uh, labour market. And we're not getting very far with this. Actually, lots of disabled people, in fact, do have training and qualifications, but they're coming up against these barriers, right? I mean, I knew a woman with four degrees and she still couldn't get a job, right? So there's, it's not a lack of training. And the final bit, which I thought I was going to say, I know what it was. It was about, because I'm worried, I don't know what's happening in England, but the other thing is to re resist diet diagnosticism. What I'm starting to find out now is some large non-disabled led charities are pushing for diagnostic specific um, initiatives like an autism commissioner or a learning disability commissioner. We need to resist that. That's a divide and rule strategy, right? We need to make sure that disability in its compl com complexity, in its variety, which is really rich, um, are brought together. And that, so if we have commissioners or we have strategies, it needs to be a a holistic approach. As soon as you start going down, see I'm waggling my finger here, as soon as you start going around that, that line of diagnosticism, diagnosticism is dangerous and it's a divide and rule strategy. Absolutely, and it's been used time and time again. Um, so it's uh, 12.29 and uh, thank you so much. Uh, absolutely fascinating um, conversation. In terms of, uh, just before we wrap it up, in terms of people um, maybe wanting to start consciousness raising group or things like that, do you, do you have any um, advice, resources, or, or should we um, send out, uh, you know, if people want to contact me, um, you've all got my email address, um, 
Yeah, yep. I think I think Pete contact you, but I would also suggest I don't know whether we've got an email address for Nadson. Uh, I mean, I haven't even run it by the board. I have mentioned it, <laughs> uh, but maybe we can just start um, collecting information because the fact that it's a national network, uh, we can kind of you know see what the interest is and um, and and get back in touch with you. We're just going to have to maybe do some modelling around it, but that might be go through Pete to get to Nadson or. Yeah, well, you can talk about that. You're you're the you're the man with uh you're the you're the web webmaster, yes. yeah. <laughs> or web or web mistress. <laughs> I'll take anything. <laughs> All good. So yeah, um, so thank you everybody for joining us. Um, if you would like to continue the conversation about disability consciousness raising, drop me an email. We'll we will be discussing it um, at the National Association of Disabled Staff Networks. Fiona, thank you so much for your time and your presentation. Absolutely brilliant. And um, we'll uh, see you all soon. So thank you very much. Yes, thank we you. Will, we'll be sending the, around the transcript and the slides. So thank you. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.